Good afternoon, Mr. Andrew Fung, Mrs. Teresa Tong, Mrs. Daisy Tong. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final competition of the three, 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 of the three minute thesis competition, 2019 of HKU. I'm Jing Leung, a year three student of the Faculty of Business and Economics. I'm Harrison Lee, a year four student from the Faculty of Science. The three minute thesis competition, or 3MT, is an academic competition developed by the University of Queensland in 2008 for research postgraduate students to explain his or her research in three minutes to the general audience. Let's enjoy a short video introducing the 3MT. galaxy ever observed by human being. A little bit more of a healthy lifespan. Oil-based fluid for this technology. Damage the lung cells and these lung cells are important. And it emits a very strong banana smell. How I wish I had that when I was young. Is that people can lose control. Friends brain process these two languages differently. The English teaching in kindergartens. And this is what I think. Counselors supervising students' ideology. The HKU 3MT competition was launched jointly by the Graduate School and Knowledge Exchange Office in 2011. This year, we have 17 research postgraduate students participating in the competition. After the hit this morning, we have 10 finalists who are going to compete for four prizes. Let me introduce our adjudicating panel to you. Professor John Bacon-Shone, Associate Director of the Knowledge Exchange Office, serving as the Chairman of the adjudicating panel. Professor Tong Yan Jin, Associate Dean of the Graduate School. Professor Maggie Lee, Professor of the Department of Sociology. Dr. Wing Yi Lo, Associate Professor of the School of Biological Sciences. And our guest of honor, Mr. Andrew Fong Hao Chong, Chief Financial Officer of Henderson Land Development Company Limited, an HKU Court member. Mrs. Teresa Tong, Certified Public Accountant, Retired partner of Ernest & Young, former chairperson of HKU Convocation, and former HKU Court member. Mrs. Stacey Tong Yun Wai Lan, former partner and notary public litigation and insolvency of deacons. It is a great honor for us to have the three distinguished guests for our adjudicating panel. On behalf of the organizers, I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the kind support from the Technology Enriched Learning Initiative, TELI, for the live streaming and video shooting of today's competition. In addition to the three winners to be decided by the adjudicating panel, there is the People's Choice Award to be determined by audience ballot through a web-based platform. Please cast a vote for one candidate whose presentation is the most engaging to you. The web-based platform will be open after the 10 presentations, and I will tell you more about it later. The 3MT final competition of HKU is about to begin. In order to avoid disruption to the candidates during the competition, let me remind you again to turn off your mobile phone to silent mode. Please show respect to our candidates and do not leave the venue after the start of a presentation. After each presentation, we will give a few seconds to the judges before inviting the next candidate. May I now invite candidate number 10, Ms. Jun Chang Lee, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Education to give her presentation on Mandarin Tone Perception in Mandarin Learners. Ms. Lee, please.
I see many overseas students here today, and I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever tried to learn Mandarin Chinese or Cantonese Chinese? Yes. Um, and have you ever felt that um, after learning the Chinese for several months, it is still hard for you to predict, to know the tones? Why? The linguistics may tell you that uh, it is normal because you do not use tones in your own language. But today, I will uh, explain this using uh, at brain level. Uh, Mandarin, I'm interested in how the Mandarin perceived in native and non-native speakers. Uh, Mandarin tones have four tones, ah, 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 and ah. So um, the tones has two features. One is pitch feature, which is um, uh, almost like music and perceived by the right hemisphere. However, and the other feature is linguistic feature, um, which is ling uh, related to language, and it is perceived by the left hemisphere. Um, so my research is to use a electrode cap to detect your brain wave of these features. For example, when we perceive the flat tone in a Mandarin word, hua, which means flower, I found that for the native speakers like me, um, I, uh, we can perceive the tones in both the right hemisphere and le left hemisphere, which suggests that we can use both the pitch feature and linguistic feature parallel to perceive tones. However, for the Mandarin learners, only the right hemisphere was activated by the tone, indicating they can only use the pitch feature of the tones. So without the helping of the linguistic information, for the tone identification, they, are less, uh, they perceive tones less efficiently than the Mandarin native speakers. So that's why they feel, wow, the tones are so difficult. So my research work contributed to the understanding of the neural mechanism of uh, language learning, especially tonal language learning. And also, it gave implication of using brain waves to uh, for future language study. Imagine that one day, if you want to test your brain ability, you just need to put a cap on your head, and without doing anything else, like uh, listening or speaking or writing, your brain wave can tell you everything. Isn't that amazing? Thank you. May I now invite candidate number 14, Ms. Ashni Dyers Mahadura, Enfield candidate of the Faculty of Science, to give her presentation on visualizing evolution, origin of new species in Hong Kong. Ms. Mahadura, please. I think you will all have heard of the Hong Kong orchid tree which is the symbol of Hong Kong 
But do you know this plant is a hybrid? My study focused on the way in which plant species hybridize and way in which hybrid produce can function as a separate species in its own right. In other words, how evolution can occur very quickly between two generations. You may have thought that evolution is a very slow process. It might surprise for you to learn that evolution can occur very quickly as a result of hybridization. For my target species in Hong Kong, there are two possible maternal parents and one paternal parent. I use a combination of reproductive biology, pollination ecology and molecular data to determine whether they interbreed. Somehow, this is similar to determining the parentage of a child. I undertook lengthy field observations in different country parks in Hong Kong and found that these two parent species have overlapping flowering seasons and are reproductively active at the same time of the day. And also, they share a common pollinator, the Asian honeybee, to transfer pollen grain from paternal to the maternal parent. After they reproduce successfully, they set seeds and produce new hybrid plants, which I found growing in the same geographical locality. But how can we know that these two hybrids are new species? Most plants, including my study species, have bisexual flowers with both male and female reproductive organs. Plants are able to sense whether the pollen carried to the flower by the pollinator B in this case comes from the same individual or not. In my study, putative parent species have lost their ability to recognize their own pollen, are therefore more likely to hybridize. But these hybrids are fertile and they favor more self-pollination. So there's less opportunity to cross with their parents. So they have their own right to survive as a new species. So knowing whether different plant species are able to hybridize is helpful in understanding the origin of new species. And this knowledge is widely applied in horticultural industry to produce new ornamental plants like orchid. So next time when you go to the flower market, you know there are hybrid origin plants and how they fall. Thank you. May I now invite candidate number 12, Ms. Kun Liu, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Engineering, to give her presentation on Controlling Microgrids to Achieve a Greener Energy Future. Ms. Liu, please. Have you ever been in a sandstorm? 
Well, I have. I was drowning in sin, and the day was dark as night. Recently, we're not only experiencing this kind of extreme weather event, but also rising temperatures and worsening air quality. The major culprit? Well, it's the burning of fossil fuels. Today, even though we talk so much about developing clean energy, still, 80% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. As an electrical engineer, my solution is to include more renewables into the power grid, specifically a microgrid, a small-scale power grid that consists of local generators and local loads. Compared to traditional power grids that transmit large amounts of power from some big power stations to a wide area of loads, microgrids are more flexible and economical because they use local power generation to meet the local demand. You may ask, why don't we just replace all the fossil fuel generators in microgrids with renewable ones? Well, a major challenge is that the power generated from the renewables is highly dependent on the weather and time of the day. The, the fluctuating renewables will cause a huge mismatch between the power generated and the power consumed, making microgrids unstable. You may say batteries can compensate for this power mismatch, but they are still too expensive. So, instead of using batteries, I designed a controller to balance this volatile renewable generation by manipulating the low voltage. The idea goes like this. Now, if the renewable generation drops, this controller senses it and lowers the voltage. Now, a key technical fact is that lowering the voltage would decrease the load consumption. So, this controller optimizes the voltage to a specific value to ensure the power stays balanced and the loads are safe. To achieve better reliability, not only do I apply this controller within a microgrid, I also coordinate the controllers in multiple microgrids so that if microgrid A has excessive power, which means generation is larger than demand, then it can help microgrid B and C that have insufficient power. In a test system with 75% renewables, this controller showed over 70% improvement in balancing the power mismatch compared with the existing controller in traditional power grids. This controller can be easily applied to all kinds of microgrids, such as small buildings, local communities, or remote islands. And it is a step further to achieve my ambition to build a greener energy future. Thanks. May I now invite candidate number 19, Mr. Kai Wong Zheng, MPhil candidate of the Faculty of Arts, to give his presentation on They are not neutral, examining museums in late colonial Hong Kong. Mr. Zheng, please. I am sure all of you have visited a museum before. But why? Did your parents and teachers force you or was it the free air conditioning? We usually go to museums to learn. We believe they present genuine knowledge of the human and natural world. Some people even call museums temples of knowledge, accurate, authentic, and objective. But have you ever wondered how museums determine what we should learn or what is worth showing? Museums are rarely neutral. They produce so-called authentic knowledge. Authorities often use them to shape collective values regulate social behavior, and build citizenship. My research shows that even the very existence of museums may not be neutral. 
My thesis looks at how museums emerged in colonial Hong Kong. I argue that the government used museums to facilitate its rule, to appease the public, and to cultivate a local identity. In 1933, the International Museums Association declared Hong Kong the most backward in the entire British Empire. Indeed, Hong Kong's first and only museum closed its doors that very year. Because the government treated Hong Kong as a trading port, they were reluctant to invest in museums. This situation changed after the leftist riots in 1967. The violence lasted for seven months and resulted in 51 deaths. This disturbance convinced the government to expand social and cultural welfare. As a result, the government decided to build more museums. In 1975, Governor Murray McLehose opened the Hong Kong Museum of History. <coughs> opened the Hong Kong Museum of History. This marked the beginning of Hong Kong's museum boom. Uh, over the next 20 years, the government opened 10 more museums. This boom never ended. Even today, more museums are being planned in Hong Kong. The government also used museums to construct a distinct Hong Kong history and culture. The aim? To foster a local identity in order to counter Chinese nationalism and communism. One example is the story of Hong Kong at the Museum of History. It narrated Hong Kong's miraculous evolution from a small fishing village into an international metropolis. It highlighted the difference between Hong Kong and mainland China. It underlined Hong Kong's cosmopolitan character. Hong Kong wasn't just different, it was better. So, next time you visit a museum, remember, museums are not neutral. Stay sharp and be critical. You may also discover their hidden agendas. Thank you. May I now invite candidate number eight, Mr. Ching Yin Nathan Kwam, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Arts, to give his presentation on the international suppression of Chinese piracy in South China, 1841 to 1899. Mr. Kwam, please. Pirates. Arr! The word conjures images of rum-swilling swashbucklers in the Caribbean, like Jack Sparrow. But the pirates I study were more like Chong Yen. In the West, pirates were the enemies of all. Any country had the right to take action against them. In the legal code of the Qing Dynasty, however, piracy was considered like any other crime and solely within its jurisdiction. These differences came to a head in the mid-19th century. My thesis argues that this conflict produced a system of cooperation and compromise between the British and Qing empires against the common problem of piracy. The British colonization of Hong Kong in 1841 introduced a foreign jurisdiction to China. From Hong Kong, British authorities imposed their international and maritime law off the China coast. This law was enforced by the muscle of the Royal Navy, which allowed the British to dominate the world's oceans for much of the 19th century. The British considered themselves justified in committing violence against Chinese pirates, they even subjected some to trial by British courts in Hong Kong, sentencing them to death. Poor Chang Yan here is but one example. The trial and execution of Chinese subjects by British tribunals violated Qing sovereignty. However, local Chinese officials struggled to suppress piracy. 
They saw British actions as an effective way of dealing with pirates, despite its questionable legality. But the Hong Kong criminal justice system proved incapable of processing the hundreds of pirates captured by the Royal Navy. What could be done against this common menace? As British and Qing officials struggled to deal with the problem of piracy, an informal system of cooperation emerged. Chinese officials, more familiar with local geography, would report pirates to British authorities. The British would send a gunboat, accompanied by a Chinese officer, to deal with the problem. The pirates were usually sent to Chinese courts for trial. This system of cooperation was responsible for some of the most impressive naval victories in the 19th century. Some engagements resulted in thousands of casualties for Chinese pirates. This Sino-British cooperation required compromise. By cooperating with the British, the Chinese, um, the Chinese sanctioned foreign violence against their own subjects. By handing pirates to courts in China, the British ceded jurisdiction over piracy to the Chinese. Through these interactions, the Chinese contributed to the development of international law in a period dominated by Western imperialism. As China grows increasingly strident in its nationalism and post-Brexit Britain seeks to re-engage with the world on its own terms, my thesis suggests that cooperation and compromise are more effective means of dealing with common problems than force and bluster. Thank you. May I now invite candidate number two, Mr. Alfred M. Roof, Enfield candidate of the Faculty of Science, to give his presentation on Illuminating Dark Matter with Nature's Time Machine. Mr. M. Roof, please. Our universe is made of matter and energy. 85% of this matter is dark matter. The reason scientists call it this is not because it signals the end of their academic careers, but because we just can't see it at all. So if we can't see it, then how do we study it? Well, Albert Einstein saved us the trouble with his prediction of gravitational lensing, which states that anything with mass can bend the path of light. Imagine you were looking at two galaxies through a telescope. The mass in the blue galaxy would bend the light from the red galaxy. If you traced back the path of the light rays, you would see the red galaxy in these positions. The problem is, conventional dark matter models cannot explain the brightness or position of these images. So a new dark matter model was proposed, wave dark matter. It behaves like waves on a beach. When waves meet at the shore, they interfere with each other and produce complex patterns. In the same way, Wave dark matter interferes at certain physical scales and produces these grainy looking patterns, much like sand on a beach. I have carried out simulations using a supercomputer to study how these patterns influence what we see through our telescopes. Simulations are the only way to probe this area of astrophysics because we just can't create a galaxy in our labs. My research has shown that patterns like this can cause significant differences to the image, shape, position, and brightness. And they are in better agreement with observations. Apart from the fact that this lets scientists get better funding and research grants, why is this important? First, accurately knowing the position and properties of these images allows us to study distant, hence very young, galaxies. And this, like time machines in sci-fi movies, Lensing acts like a natural time machine and allows us to peer back into the past and study the early universe. 
This tells us how our universe was created and reached its current state. Secondly, this allows us to know what our universe is really made of at the fundamental level. And then, people can ask, what could dark matter possibly do in our everyday lives? I like to use this analogy. Humanity in its infancy was dramatically shaped by the discovery of fire. I like to think that dark matter would be the next ultimate discovery to propel humanity into an advanced civilization that is capable of expanding beyond Earth. Thank you. May I now invite candidate number nine, Mr. Chapman Lee, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Engineering, to give his presentation on phrase, the new phrase for tomorrow cancer diagnosis. Mr. Lee, please. An essential symptoms of early cancer, cancer cells is the pres uh, presence of cancer cells in your blood. To detect it, you can actually give a timely cancer diagnosis uh, during your uh, regular uh, body check. So that's why you will have a, a, a real-time treatment. Well, uh, indeed, if, uh, however, right now the current method requires a massive amount of chemicals to do so, so it makes it impractical. Try to imagine it sounds like a human's. So right now, the, this method is like making name badges for everyone on this earth. So who wears it is the cancer cells. That's why you seek for it. And this accurate method is costly. So that motivates me to find another approach that is cost effective. Names are not the only thing for human recognition. Just like now, you look at my face, not my name badges to recognize me. So our face, our eyes, nose, and skin tell us who we are, and also our races. So that's why there is your face image on your ID card to recognize yourself besides your name. So then I start to imagine imaging could be a cost-effective way to find the cancer cells in the blood. If cells have their own faces, just like humans. So do they? Through my research, now I can tell you confidently, yes, they do. In my research, I developed an advanced imaging technique called face imaging to capture the cell face. It shoots the cells from multiple angles to capture their face. And just like human faces, what it gives you is unique features for different species of cells. For instance, two types of blood cancer cells and three types of breast cancer cells as can be uh, successfully distinguished from the normal, with an accuracy over 90%. This is as accurate as the current method even now without any chemicals. And combining with our world's fastest camera invented in our lab, this can be done within an hour. But we all know, not just the speed and also the accuracies you and I concerned most, but also the reliability. So I reviewed this method multiple times and shown that its high accuracy is not just by luck, but actually it can be robustly reproduced. And to further convince ourselves, patients and doctors that this method can jump out of the laboratory. I apply this face imaging on mouse models, the mouse with human cancer. And it might sound too good to be true. Once again, it successfully detects the cancer cells in the mouse blood. A tiny, accurate, and cost-effective cancer diagnosis is not far away from us now. With this face imaging, 
we can actually get it and we'll open a new phase for tomorrow's cancer diagnosis. Thank you. May I now invite candidate number four, Ms. Jia Yi Chan, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Dentistry, to give her presentation on a magic touch to stop tooth decay. Ms. Chan, please. Can you imagine how many kindergarten children in Hong Kong are suffering from tooth decay nowadays? 10%? or 20%. Actually, over 50% of the five-year-old children have decayed teeth, and they are experiencing discomfort or pain. What can we do to help these children? Traditional restorative treatment with drilling sometimes is too frightening to young children. Is there any simple, effective, and easy to accept way to manage this disease? Yes, there is. To stop active tooth decay, two things need to be done. One is to kill the bacteria, and the other one is to strengthen the teeth to stop the invasion of the bacteria. Both can be achieved by just applying medical agents on the decay cavity, which is also called the decay lesion. My research topic is to investigate the effectiveness of a novel product in stopping active tooth decay for kindergarten children. Previous study suggests that silver nitrate has strong antibacterial property, and sodium fluoride helps to strengthen the teeth. They should be used together. Nowadays, functionalized tricalcium phosphate, which is short for FTCP, is added into sodium fluoride to improve its ability. Yet, the effectiveness of the use of silver nitrate and sodium fluoride with FTCP in stopping active tooth decay remains unknown. Therefore, 408 three-year-old kindergarten children with at least one active decay lesion were recruited in my study and allocated equally into two groups. Children in the control group were treated with silver nitrate and sodium fluoride, while the ones in the test group were treated with silver nitrate and sodium fluoride with FTCP. All of them received dental checkup and medical treatment applied by a small brush every six months in the kindergarten. After a year, more than 50% of the active decay lesions in the test group were stopped successfully, and there are around 10% more stopped when compared to the control group. This indicates that the use of silver nitrate and sodium fluoride with FTCP is more effective in stopping active tooth decay. More children can be released from pain by this simple, wild, magic touch. And they don't have to experience the frightening drilling in dental clinic. What can be more encouraging than hearing the children say thank you with their angelic smile after the treatment? It's all worthwhile. Thank you.
May I now invite candidate number seven, Ms. Kumayi, PhD candidate of the Li Ka Sheng Faculty of Medicine, to give her presentation on a weapon in need is a virus in need. Ms. Kumayi, please. This hall, we all are normal human beings. Imagine, suddenly I turn to a zombie and I have this power of self-dividing and hurting everyone. How scary would that be? Very scary, right? Similar situations happen when our healthy cells turn cancerous. My research is about lung cancer. It's one of the deadliest cancer. One among every 12 people are likely to get it. Well, we have solutions. Surgery, radiation, and drugs. But they have their own limitations. Sometimes finding the perfect drugs combination may take months to a year. Do our loved ones have that much of time? Besides, it also affects healthy cells, creating a huge side effects. In some cases, patients may even die of these side effects rather than cancer itself. So what to do? Well, we need a more targeted approach that can only kill cancer cells. That is what I aim to study in my research. I met these tiny little guys called viruses. Well, all viruses are not bad, like HIV or Ebola. My research is a Newcastle disease virus or NDV. It's a birth virus, and it's not harmful to human healthy cells, but yes to cancer cells. I have sequenced nearly 1,000 NDV viruses to find very few potential anti-cancer agents. Next, I developed a mice model having two tumors, and I injected only one of those tumors with NDV. The results were remarkable. I found the mice survived, the tumor reduced, and no side effects. So what happened? Let's see. Imagine this is a tumor, and inside the tumor is a very secretive place. Difficult for the drugs to reach, and difficult for our host immune to detect it. But I found, after NDV infection, this cancer cell started producing certain amount of proteins. Now these proteins affect nearby cancer cells, producing more and more proteins. The tumor site is now an inflammatory site, drawing the attention of host's bigger defensive system to enter and kill it. Since the host immune response is now triggered, it also helped in the reduction of the distant tumor that was not infected with NDV. Apart from it, I found NDV infection can induce apoptosis or programmed cell death. This mechanism is usually damaged in cancer cells, causing them to divide in an uncontrolled manner. NDV is like a nanobiological machine that in future, it can be engineered to make a perfect vaccine candidate. What we need to fight this cancerous zombie, a perfect weapon. That could be NDV. Thank you. May I now invite candidate number 15, Ms. Oi Kwan Mak, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Science, to give her presentation on Secretin, a water balance in our body. Ms. Mak, please. Imagine when you get lost in a desert, what will you look for at first? A human can go for more than three days without food, but the water is a different story. A U.S. couple got lost in a desert and getting out from the car trying to look for help, but later found death just within two hours because of dehydration. 
Water balance is very critical for our survival. Each day, we lose around two to three liters of water through eating, sweating, going to bathroom, or even just sitting here and breathing. To compensate water loss, our brain is a little smarter than us. Scientists have discovered SFO, OVLT, and MMPO responsible for water balance. To interconnect between these stations, the brain needs neurotransmitters. In my study, I found that secretine, a classical gut hormone, turns out playing an important role in here. To showcase the importance of secretine in our headquarters, I removed secretin specifically from the SFO by viral injection in mice and found that they drank significantly less water even though they were so dry compared to the normal mice. Meanwhile, I found that secretin is working with the excitatory neurons in the SFO, sending signals to the OVLT and controlling us to water drinking action. Secretin not only works in the SFO but also works in the MMPO to prevent us from overconsuming water. The first neurons and the secretin signals are suppressed once you drink water prior to the actual blood water level changes. That explains why the feeling of thirsty will be quenched instantly when you just taste the water. As I mentioned earlier, our brain is little smarter than us. We can never fake it. In the study, I provide the mice two fluid sources, water and a salty water. The normal mice are so smart to pick water to drink instead of a salty water when they were dehydrated. Just like the man in this comic, he threw the sparkling water away and thirsty to death. However, if I remove the secretin from the SFO, they no longer to differentiate water and the salty water. In total, secretin just like a pilot sitting in front of a controller panel detecting the water level changes all the time and deciding the following steps to keep our water level constant. Without the pilot, the water level will lose balance and our body will be crushed. Optimal hydration can lower the chance of stroke, hair managing diabetics, and also reducing the risk of cancer. The study of first is so fascinating and by understanding it can help solving a lot of water disorder diseases. So don't forget secretin, a tiny protein, but big impact to our water balance. Thank you.
Thank you for coming back. Before we announce the result, let me invite our guest of honor, Mrs. Stacy Tong, to say a few words about the candidate's presentations. Mrs. Stacy Tong, please. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I only have one minute, unlike the other candidates. Um, it's indeed my greatest honor to adjudicate um, on the preempt. It's the first time in my experience. I am a lawyer by profession. So the 10 topics delivered by the candidates, they are all um, really unusual, interesting, brand new ideas to me. So I only have a few general comments, if I may. Um, I think choosing the title is the first step. So I was looking at the title of the 10 thesis, and um, some really appealed to me more. And I think, if I may, suggest the candidates um, is, you, most of them are very calm. But I do suggest that you do not use too many of these hand gestures. Um, I think there are quite a few who was only doing three and two and one, that kind of thing. So we are not kindergarten. So I think it's um, quite good for you to present with uh, confidence, with your very useful slide, and um, just be yourself. And I also have one observation. I know three minutes would not do too much justice to a very important thesis and possibly some very important uh, inventions or observations of your life. Um, but it is good for you to communicate to your audience by at least getting us know what the main points right at the beginning or maybe at the conclusion. So that we, we know, say, sequentin, for example, is a protein. Uh, I listened intensively um, every presentation and try to understand and grasp what are the main issues, the main points, and the main challenges. Um, actually, I do congratulate, uh, this is not a regular remarks, I do congratulate all 10 candidates. They are very impressive, 
very good presentations with the strict three minutes limitations. You do have my admiration and um, good luck wherever you will be. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. May I now invite Mrs. Teresa Tong to say a few words for us. Mrs. Teresa Tong, please. Feel free, as you like. Oh. Maybe you can use that one then. Yeah, for sure, for sure. This is most interesting, actually. Um, can I put an application next year, give me the notice, even if I'm not coming in the adjudicator, I really want to be an audience. Because um, the reason why I find it particularly interesting is as a career, I'm a certified public accountant, but as a private investor, I have been funding startup investments in my past 30 years, and I meet um, people coming in to raise funds for their startup, which actually is a subsequent event or a research coming in for the funding. And we don't give them too much time because um, we're busy and if they cannot deliver their concept within 50 minutes, we almost write off that investment. And I'm glad to say that after sitting through with the 10 presentation, a couple I'm particularly interested in funding and all of it, all of you, I would say, pass the 15, markers, 15 minutes market test for as a funder. Now, when people say you're good, if they say you're good plus they're willing to put the money into your research, that's two things. Someone would say it's an interesting project, but they're not ready to support it with money. That's a different thing. So I would say all of the, I would like to congratulate all the presenters. Your topics are interesting, but I really want you to land it somewhere because um, your research could be interesting, but it cannot land into everyday life, uh, land into a project that could be a business concern that may be a disadvantage to that. So therefore, that's really my top ins to the topic. Um, interesting, but before you choose the topic, one other thing I really want you to alert you to. If you are chosen as the, the, the champion for this, you will be presenting your same topic in the international arena where it's, if your topic's too local. A couple of the topics today are so local that only Chinese or Hong, Hong Kong Earths can understand the background to it. That would disadvantage you. It's almost like when you go to international song contest. Don't choose a song that only is understood by the Chinese or the Indians or the, the Malaysians, but get an international song. And that's really how you choose a topic would decide on the, your, your, your success. Um, again, just that's my topics, but I would like to congratulate all 10 of you. You've done an excellent task and uh, keep the hard work up. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. May I now invite Mr. Andrew Fong to say a few words for us. Mr. Fong, please. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I, I have to congratulate all of you. Uh, actually, uh, technically, three minutes is, uh, is a very difficult uh, test because uh, if it's 20 minutes, basically, we will lose concentration. Anyone will lose concentration. For three, for three minutes, everybody technically will be very focused. And if you any, will pick up any weaknesses and mistake. So a three minute uh, presentation is very challenging itself, technically, I think. Uh, but I find very little shortfalls for me to comment. So first, congratulations on that. And second is I think uh, um, Almost all of you have very confident and very good control of timing. And uh, the only, the only li little imbalance is in two or three presentations. I think uh, one or two or three of you have give, tried to give too much content 
into for the few minutes. But actually, uh, most impressive is I'm 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 an art student. I have uh, given up science since my junior high school. But in three minutes, most of you, the science the science ones. Uh, convince me at least, it, I seem to understand what you are talking about. So, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fong. May I now invite Professor John Bacon-Shon, Associate Director of the Knowledge Exchange Office and Chairman of the Adjudicating Panel to say a few words for us. Professor Bacon-Shon, please. Okay, another competition over, another wonderful set of presentations. I mainly want to thank our three external guests who come and helped us with the judging this afternoon. I think you can hear from their expressions how impressed they are. It makes me proud to be in Hong Kong U. Uh, one thing I do want to pick up on that uh, Mrs. Teresa Tong said, the issue about communicating with the world outside. So as I mentioned this morning, when you become full academics, when you're no longer a student, you will discover that actually many academics don't have the skill to be able to communicate very well with the world outside. They spend most of their energy worrying about academic presentations. So those are obviously important, but knowing how to communicate well, whether it's having a great title, whether it's not having jargon that people don't understand, whether it's having a great analogy that people can understand the idea, these are all means to an end. So we need to recognize in the big scheme of things, even if you don't need funding for your research project individually from a donor, we still have to persuade the community that to get, they should be giving more money to the universities. That's not gonna happen if we haven't all played our role in making sure that people out side can understand the benefits. And it doesn't have to be a, a science or an engineering project. This also applies for the arts, humanities, and social science, right? We have an obligation to make sure that people outside can understand. So please keep it up. Don't just look at it as a competition. Don't just think of it as, oh yes, that helps me with my next conference presentation. Those are great things to benefit, but also think about how you can communicate with other people outside the university using the skills which you have learned here today. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Professor Bacon Shong. All the finalists will now receive a certificate of merit in recognition of their outstanding performance. Would the finalists please get onto the stage in the presentation sequence? May we now invite our guests of honor, Mrs. Teresa Tong, Mrs. Stacy Tong, and Mr. Andrew Fong for a photo with the finalists.
Thank you very much. We are about to announce the winners of four prizes. The champion, the first runner-up, the second runner-up, and the People's Choice Award. The winner of the People's Choice Award will receive research travel support or book prize at 3,500 Hong Kong dollars. May I now invite Mrs. Teresa Tong to present the People's Choice Award for us. Mrs. Teresa Tong, please. The winner of the People's Choice Award is number nine, Mr. Chapman Lee, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Engineering. His presentation was on phrase, the new phrase for tomorrow cancer diagnosis, and his supervisor is Dr. Calvin Lee. Kim Man Tse. Congratulations to Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. May I now invite Professor Mi Lan Chai, Dean of Graduate School, to present the second runner up award. The second runner up will receive research travel support or book prize at 3,500 Hong Kong dollars. The second runner-up is number eight, Mr. Ching Ying Nathan Kwan, PhD, candidate of the Faculty of Arts. His presentation was on the international suppression of Chinese piracy in South China, 1841 to 1899, and his supervisor is Professor John Mark Carroll. Congratulations to Mr. Kwan. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Chai. May I now invite Mr. Andrew Fung to present the first runner-up award. The first runner-up will receive research travel support or book prize at 6,500 Hong Kong dollars. The first runner-up is number 15, Ms. Oi Kwan, Oi Kwan Mac, PhD candidate of the Faculty of Science. Her presentation was on Secretin, a water balance in our body, and her supervisor is Professor Billy Kwang Chow, Kwang Chung Chow. Congratulations to Ms. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Fong. May I now invite Mrs. Daisy Tong to present the Champion Award. The Champion will receive research travel support or book prize at 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. The champion of the three minute thesis competition 2019 of the University of Hong Kong <laughs> is number two, Mr. Alfred M. Roof, Enfield candidate of the Faculty of Science. His presentation was on illuminating dark matter with nature's time machine. And his supervisor is Dr. Jeremy, Jeremy Jin Long Lim. Congratulations to Mr. Amruf. Please remain on stage for a photo with all the winners. To mark this memorable occasion, may I now invite the first runner-up, second runner-up, People's Choice Award winner, Mrs. Teresa Tong, Mr. Andrew Fong, Professor Mi Lin Chai, 
Professor Bernadette Choi, Director of Development Alumni Affairs Office. Professor Dong Yan Jin. Professor Maggie Lee. Dr. Wing Yi Lo. Professor John Bacon Shon. And the winner's supervisors to come on stage for a photo. Please remain on stage. May I now invite all finalists and their supervisors to join us on stage for another photo. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations again to all the candidates for your excellent performance today. On behalf of the event organizer, we'd like to extend our deepest appreciation to all our judges and guests for being here with us today. It's been our pleasure to host the Hong Kong U 3-Minute Thesis Competition. Thank you very much for your support and see you again next year.